Michael Jackson will forever be remembered as the greatest entertainer of a generation. His groundbreaking dance moves, iconic vocal style and countless hit singles have cemented him in the hearts and hips of legions of devoted fans around the world. At 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, June 25th, 2009, those fans who had been overjoyed at the announcement of a comeback tour were left devastated. The King of Pop had been pronounced dead. Right, um, my brother, the legendary King of Pop, Michael Jackson, passed away on Thursday, June 25th, 2009 at 2.26 p.m. At just 50 years old, Michael Jackson had suffered a fatal heart attack. Found in his rented home in Bel Air at 12.30 p.m., news of Jackson's collapse had flown throughout the world, and when the terrible truth was finally revealed, loyal fans plummeted into despair. With candlelit vigils across the globe, they demonstrated their devotion in a touching salute to their hero. Many were struggling to come to terms with the realization that he was gone. My reaction was shock because he's a very young man, still at 50 years old, and he was a good person. He had his problems, but he was still a good person. It's kind of devastating. He's one of those people that you never would have thought of dying so soon because you think of all he did for like music and music videos and pop culture. The Jackson Estate in Encino, California became a shrine to Michael with flowers, balloons, and messages strewn along the walls and outside the gates as fans gathered to pay their last respects. Accompanied by longtime family friend, Reverend Al Sharpton, Michael's father, Joe, took in the tributes and shook hands with his son's grieving fans. And the family and I are very proud to see all of you come out here and and then and help us with this whole situation because we know that we do have fans all over the world we know that we are loved all over the world but one thing that um, I wish could have happened I wish that Michael could be here to see all this have to wait till something happened like this before before uh, it could be uh, realized Meanwhile, over in Gary, Indiana, the house where Michael and his eight siblings grew up had also become a mecca for grieving fans and neighbors, who still remembered baby-faced Michael from his days as the youngest member of the Jackson Five. It hurt to know that Michael passed on, but he'll always be remembered. And right here in Gary, Indiana, we would always love the Jackson Five. Regardless to whatever they say about him or whatever happened in the past, we here in Gary love the Jacksons. Twenty-five miles southeast of downtown Chicago, the city of Gary was founded in 1906 by the United States Steel Corporation. It got its name from company chairman Albert H. Gary and was one of the first cities in the U.S. to elect an African-American mayor. It was here that former boxer Joseph Walter Jackson settled with his new wife, Catherine, in 1949. While Catherine got straight down to the business of raising children, Joe took a full-time job as a crane operator at the steel mill to support their growing family, although clearly his passion lay in another direction. 
In the mid-1950s, he embarked on a musical career, playing guitar in a band called The Falcons with his brother Luther. When The Falcons failed to score a record contract, the reality of having seven young mouths to feed forced Joe to return to his old job at the steel mill. But before long, he'd begun pouring his creative aspirations into a family singing act made up of his three eldest sons. As the Jackson brothers, Jackie, Tito and Jermaine, were backed up on congas and tambourine by Marlon and six-year-old Michael, who soon began to eclipse his older brothers with his singing and dancing talents. Stopping at nothing to make the group a success, Joe put the boys through strenuous rehearsals. But there was no shortage of love and comfort to be found in the arms of their mother. Everyone loved Catherine. I think that she was very much revered. She was um, a very spiritual woman, a Jehovah Witness, and she was the gentle force in the Jackson family. In 1967, with nine-year-old Michael at the helm, the Jackson brothers became the Jackson Five. After winning a talent show at a local high school performing soul and R&B hits, Joe got busy booking his young prodigies into black clubs and venues around Gary and Chicago on the Chitlin circuit. All the while, little Michael continued honing his singing and dancing skills, learning from watching the likes of James Brown, Marvin Gaye and Etta James. As their fame grew in and around Indiana, they began taking their act further afield, and by the middle of 1967, they'd made it to New York. With the help of R&B legends Sam and Dave, they scored a spot at the prestigious amateur night competition at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. Billed as the place where stars are born and legends are made, the famous theatre, which had played host to legends like Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday, certainly lived up to its promise for the Jackson Five. After winning the Amateur Night Showdown on August 13, Gladys Knight brought them to the attention of Motown chief Berry Gordy. Although Berry was initially reluctant to take on another child act, after signing little Stevie Wonder, he eventually granted them an audition at Motown and in late 1968, he was blown away by a 10-year-old Michael Jackson. He always wanted to be the best and was willing to work as hard as it took to be that. And we could all see, you know, that he was a winner at that age. And uh, I've always believed winners are winners long before they win. And uh, picking them out before they win was very easy with uh, Michael Jackson. The following year, he moved the Jackson Five to California to begin grooming them as Motown's next hit-making act. In a later interview, he described the group as, quote-unquote, the last big stars to come rolling off my assembly line. While the older brothers stayed with Berry, Marlon and Michael moved in with Motown queen Diana Ross. The move was all part of a cunning marketing plan to attach Motown's newest act to one of its biggest stars. The press kit later claimed that Diana had personally discovered the group and introduced them to Motown. The next step was to buy the group out of their contract with the Steeltown label, which had released three Jackson 5 singles the previous year. Written by Berry Gordy and the corporation, the Jackson 5's first single, I Want You Back, hit number one in 1970 and made 11-year-old Michael an instant sensation. They followed up with three more consecutive Billboard number ones. Within a year, Jackson Mania was sweeping the nation. In 1971, Motown decided to capitalize on the surging popularity of their youngest star by launching a spin-off solo career for Michael. As well as landing a top five hit with the single Got To Be There, he also sang the title track to the movie Ben. Taken from his second solo album of the same name, it was to be the first number one single of his solo career. They're back there uh, doing it together and uh, he just sort of grew up under the Motown banner and uh, while most people, people think that he had no fun in his childhood, he did a lot that brought joy to him. But with Michael and the rest of the Jackson Five maturing musically as well as physically, 
they felt stifled and blamed their declining success on Motown's refusal to grant them creative control. In 1975, they made the move to CBS. After another three years of touring and recording with the Jacksons, Michael was ready for his next big adventure when he got the call from his former landlady and ex-Motown stablemate, Diana Ross. Diana had been cast as Dorothy in the big screen version of the Broadway musical The Wiz. Directed by Sidney Lumet and set in New York City, it was to be an all-black reworking of the 1939 adaptation of Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz. Signing on to play the brainless scarecrow, it gave Michael a chance to flex his acting muscles. It also introduced him to arranger, composer and producer extraordinaire Quincy Jones. Quincy had been so impressed with Michael's dedication to nailing the graceful moves of the Scarecrow in The Wiz that when he got the call to co-produce the young singer's next album, he jumped at the chance. The result of their first collaboration was the 1979 smash Off The Wall, which had one reviewer hailing Michael as probably the best singer in the world right now in terms of style and technique. Rolling Stone magazine pronounced Michael's feathery timbered tenor extraordinarily beautiful. Michael wrote three songs on the album, including the number one single, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. Other songs were provided by Paul McCartney and fellow former child star Stevie Wonder, who co-wrote I Can't Help It. The album's title song and the hit Rock With You were penned by British songwriter Rod Temperton. Off the Wall became the first album by a solo artist to generate four US top 10 hits and has since gone on to sell over 20 million copies worldwide. At 21 years old, Michael Jackson had mastered the transition from cute child prodigy to full-blown pop superstar. Now he was public property. Everywhere he went, people loved him and Michael loved them right back. In those years, we could hang out and we could go to things together, like see The Wiz and see on Broadway. He liked Stephanie Mills and The Wiz. And, uh, you know, watch the kids come up to him and all want the autographs. And I would say, why don't you just sign, you know, MJ instead of Michael Jackson, just the way Andy Warhol always signs everything at AW. He says, oh, no, I could never do that. These are my fans. These people make me. And he was, he was so darling and sincere and sweet in those years. Some loved him for his music. For others, it was his dancing. But for so many more fans, it was Michael Jackson's importance as a role model that earned him their admiration. For thousands of African Americans, his incredible mainstream success turned him into an ambassador for race relations. By Off the Wall, he was doing amazingly well, and that was his first cover of Rolling Stone, and we were breaking barriers. It was very hard to get someone who wasn't white on the cover of magazines or even MTV. Mobbed by fans wherever he went, people of all colors were chanting his name in the streets, queuing for hours for a glimpse of him, then fainting at the sight of him. With Michael egging them on, they would even chase him across highways. Children from every corner of the globe wanted to sing like him, dress like him, and dance like him. But there could only ever be one Michael Jackson. And in 1982, he was on the verge of boldly going where no other entertainer had ever gone before. First up, he was asked to contribute a theme song to Steven Spielberg's blockbuster children's fantasy, E.T. Michael duly came up with Someone in the Dark. Although it didn't end up in the movie, the song appeared on the storybook for the film, which won a Grammy Award for Best Album for Children. Whatever had come before in Michael's illustrious career would be remembered as merely a warm-up act to the release of his next project. On November the 30th, 1982, the world was introduced to the album that would go down in history as the biggest seller of all time. Thriller, his second collaboration with Quincy Jones, was the result of Michael's determination to create the perfect record. Locked away in Westlake Studios in LA, with a production budget of $750,000, they emerged with an album that would spend 37 weeks at the top of Billboard charts, 
and would spawn an unprecedented seven top ten singles. I remember not getting my platinum album for singing on PYT, singing the backgrounds on that. Yeah, it was great. What I really remember, though, from Thriller was being in Mike's car and him playing me the entire album. Whenever he would finish a project, he'd share it with me because we were, we were like this growing up. And I remember loving each and every song. I was just, what, 16, something like that. But the jewel in the Thriller crown was the 14-minute video to the album's title track. Inspired by B-grade zombie movies and directed by horror supremo John Landis, the short film featured barrier-breaking special effects and debuted the formation dancing that was to become just one of Michael's signatures. With the album selling in excess of a million copies a month, Michael was hailed as the savior of the flagging music industry, as well as a champion for racial equality. Music channel MTV, notorious for its neglect of African-American musicians, was forced to play the Thriller video clip twice an hour to cope with viewer demand. Then there were the awards. As well as an incredible seven Grammys, Michael took out a total of eight American Music Awards, the Special Award of Merit, and three MTV Music Awards. I saw him for many years. I saw the off-the-wall success and the thriller success, the super success. Before that, we had other going places. We had other records and parties at Studio 54. And, but with Thriller, every barrier was broken. Stadiums all over the world were sold out. It became the biggest record of all time. According to journalist and biographer J. Randy Tarabarelli, Thriller stopped selling like a leisure album and began selling like a household staple. It also spawned a bonanza in merchandising sales. Alongside Michael Jackson dolls, t-shirts and other memorabilia, there were millions to be made from sales of the making of Michael Jackson's thriller documentary. The so-called one-man rescue team for the music business even had future president George Bush eating out of his gloved hand. It was fantastic. The 80s were fantastic. Uh, uh, it's probably as good as, as our record business will ever be, I mean, on, on that basis. Number one, for many reasons, because of vinyl. People would wear vinyl out there to go buy, buy two and three copies. I was lucky. I had the two best engineers on the planet, <laughs> uh, Phil Ramon and, uh, and uh, Bruce Swedeen, and they had, a, 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 they had minors in music. They were both musical and technical sonic minds. And to this day, every city I go to in the world, Shanghai, Shenzhen, wherever, Rio, Cairo, at that magic hour, they, I hear those records, we don't stop to get enough from 30 years ago, and it blows my mind, it really does. But it's just, it's all the songs, and Michael's talent, and the production, and everything else, but sonically, it's hard to beat. Without doubt, Thriller owed much of its phenomenal success to Michael's dazzling performance in the famous 1983 television special to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Motown. Ironically, however, it almost didn't happen. We were doing um, the TV show and the word came back that Michael couldn't do it because he was doing too much television. And uh, I called Michael up and I said, Michael, I know you and you know me, and you know, this television show is not a television show, this is Motown 25. And he said, I'll be there. And he came there, and then he did the moonwalk. In the middle of a rendition of Billie Jean, Michael debuted the legendary dance move that was to seal his reputation as the greatest innovator in pop music. The performance, witnessed by 47 million viewers, was declared a career-defining moment by commentators and drew comparisons with appearances by the Beatles and Elvis Presley on The Ed Sullivan Show in the 1960s. Developed by Michael after studying the great master of mime, Marcel Marceau, the moonwalk has since become one of the best-known dance techniques in the world. Right at the very height of his powers, however, Michael was headed for a date with destiny that would have serious physical and psychological repercussions in his life. 
A year after releasing Thriller, he signed a record-shattering deal with soft drink manufacturer Pepsi. The $5 million partnership was the first sponsorship deal of its kind and would form the basis of celebrity endorsements of the future. The idea was to lock Michael into a decade-long partnership that would help Pepsi challenge Coca-Cola's dominance of the market. Sadly, however, the plan was about to go very wrong. On the 27th of January, the stage was set for Michael and his brothers to perform Billie Jean as part of one of the Pepsi commercials. During filming, a pyrotechnic effect went wrong. The explosion showered Michael with sparks, setting fire to his hair. 3,000 fans watched in shock as paramedics covered his head and carried him away to hospital. He came out between these things that exploded like fireworks, and then it looked like the sparks came down on his hair, and he was shaking his head like he thought something was in his hair. And then everybody jumped on him and started squirting water on him, and he got up like he didn't know what was happening, and they took him off. As Michael began the agonizing recovery process, which included surgery to hide his scalp burns and an introduction to prescribed painkillers, his faithful fans gathered outside the hospital to wish him well. But rather than wallowing in his own troubles, Michael characteristically threw himself into caring for those less fortunate than himself. As well as donating $5 million from the Jackson's Victory Tour to charity, he co-wrote the single We Are The World with Lionel Richie to raise money for famine relief. Delving into their little black books of A-list artists, he and Lionel pulled in a who's who of the music scene. The single ended up featuring the singing talents of stars like Bruce Springsteen, Dionne Warwick, Tina Turner, Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder, Paul Simon and Cyndi Lauper. Produced by Quincy Jones in 1985, it ended up selling more than 20 million copies and raising millions of dollars for the poor in the US and Africa. Around the same time, Michael was engaged in a well-publicized battle to buy a catalogue of songs by the Beatles that had come up for sale the previous year. Rumours abounded that Michael's aggressive bid had caused a rift with his old friend Paul McCartney, with whom he'd recorded the hits The Girl Is Mine and Say Say Say. Ironically, it had been Paul who had first put the idea of buying the music catalogue in his head by telling him how much money was to be made in publishing royalties. And in actual fact, when the Northern Songs catalogue came up for sale, although Paul had considered launching a late bid for the songs in league with John's widow, Yoko, he had pulled out of the race, leaving Michael to battle it out with other serious contenders in negotiations that lasted 10 months. He ended up winning the catalogue at a cost of $47.5 million. As the 80s wore on, media attention began to focus on Michael's perceived eccentricities. What was really going on behind those aviator sunglasses? First, there was his pet chimp, Bubbles. Then there were reports that he slept in a hyperbaric chamber, talk of plastic surgery, and rumors that he bought the bones of the elephant man. Many of the rumors were claimed to have been leaked to the press by Michael's own publicists. But despite his insistence that such stories were pure fabrications, the nickname Wacko Jacko stuck. Appearing in public hidden behind a face mask only fueled speculation about his increasingly idiosyncratic behavior, which was rumored to involve bleaching his skin. Michael hit back with claims that the marked change in his skin color was caused by the disease of vitiligo, which needed to be covered up with makeup. Through all of the media's attacks, the fans just kept on coming. Swamped at public appearances and record signings, Michael Jackson had become a modern-day Pied Piper of Hamlin. And although he often felt stung by the stories in the press, he clearly reveled in the superstar status that set him apart from ordinary mortals. Michael Jackson refuses to give in to the, uh, the rumor that he is not a normal human being. He seems to kind of want people to not believe he's, he's like everybody else. And I don't think he should. Why should he? You know, apart from anything else, he's broken every sales record on earth. He has achieved things that nobody else has. So why should he just pretend to be, I don't know, uh, Damon Albarn from Blur? Wherever the man in the mask went, he was met with a media frenzy. 
and like the ringmaster in a three-ring circus, he never forgot his role as entertainer and knew exactly how to work the crowd. Whether popping in to share an intimate photo opportunity with children at a local hospital, making a dash for the limo in front of the paparazzi, or entertaining his beloved fans from the roof of his hotel building, the King of Pop never failed to turn on the charm. Through the years I worked with Michael, the, the greatest moment of my life was, was that moment after the show or, or a couple days after we would do a photo shoot when I would show him the bulk of the pictures and he would look at them and he would say, that's magic, that's magic. And, and this is Michael's life. It's all about magic. It's all about creating that, that magic. And there was plenty more magic to come. Back in the studio with Quincy Jones, Michael was preparing to release his seventh studio album, his first in five years. After recording 30 tracks for the new album, they cut the selection down to 11 songs, and Bad hit the shelves on August the 31st, 1987. As the name suggested, Michael was adopting a tougher street image and bringing plenty of grunt to songs like Dirty Diana, Smooth Criminal, and the album's title track. In all, Michael wrote nine of the album's 11 songs, five of which struck the top of the US singles charts. To this day, Bad remains the only album ever to achieve this incredible feat. Now as popular in the UK as he was in the States, Bad went on to become the ninth biggest selling album in British history. One of the highlights on the album was the bonus track Leave Me Alone, which made fun of the tabloid view of his private life. The video, directed by Jim Blashfield, won the Grammy Award for Best Video and an MTV Music Award. Meanwhile, Michael was preparing to take on his very first world concert tour as a solo artist. Sponsored by Pepsi, the Bad Tour took him to 15 countries over 16 months, during which he played to a total of 4.5 million fans. The first entertainer to earn more than $100 million per year, Michael was becoming increasingly devoted in his responsibility as a philanthropist, donating much of his concert takings to charity and ensuring that at least 400 tickets to every US concert were reserved for underprivileged children. During the tour, Michael bought the ranch in Santa Barbara, California, that would help him fulfill his dream of building his very own amusement park. Renamed Neverland after the fantasy island in the story of Peter Pan, it would become a lavish monument to his extravagantly childlike imagination. Complete with a zoo, two railroads, numerous rides, and several lakes, Michael opened Neverland up to children and their families as day visitors. The 2,676-acre property also boasted a huge floral clock. The story goes that Michael himself designed the decorative flower beds because he hated seeing dirt between them. Neverland would remain Michael's own personal fairground for the next 15 years, creating many happy memories for the friends and guests he entertained there until the police investigations of 2003. I can remember an amazing time in, in, at Neverland in, in the amusement park and uh, when Michael insisted that if I was going to shoot him on a particular ride, I had to ride the ride with him with my hands not on the bar, but, but up in the air like, like, you know, like kids would. And I thought, okay, <laughs> and I did. This, is, this will, will always be one of my fondest memories of Michael, just having fun. In 1991, Michael was clearly still having fun as he renewed his contract with Sony. Having been declared the artist of the decade by President George Bush, he was able to command a record-breaking sum of $65 million. The same year, he released his seventh studio album, Dangerous. With Teddy Riley and Bill Bottrell on board as co-producers, it went straight to number one on the Billboard charts and became his fastest-selling album ever in the US. Its lead single, Black or White, spent seven consecutive weeks on top of the singles charts, proving that Michael was still the king of pop. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the UK and Europe, the album's biggest selling single ended up being the charity anthem, Heal the World, which also became the name of the charitable foundation Michael set up in 1992. 
To heal the world, we must start by healing our children. Today, we come bearing gifts for the children of war-torn Sarajevo. In 1992, Sarajevo has become a symbol of so much that is tragic but avoidable in our world. Prejudice and ethnic hatred, the destruction of the environment, the shattering of families and of centuries-old communities. One of the Foundation's first missions was to airlift 46 tons of much-needed supplies to war-torn Sarajevo in Bosnia. Another of Michael's early ambitions for the Foundation was to institute drug and alcohol education programs. He was also one of the very first artists to draw attention to HIV AIDS in the Third World by embarking on several high-profile visits to Africa and ended up donating all the profits from the ticket sales of his sell-out dangerous tour to his foundation. But back at home, trouble was brewing. On August the 18th, 1993, as Michael prepared to start the third leg of his tour, the Los Angeles Police Department began a criminal investigation into child abuse claims. Three days later, police arrived to search Neverland and subjected Michael to a 25-minute strip search. The media had a field day. I will say that I am particularly upset by the handling of this mass matter by the incredible, terrible mass media. At every opportunity, the media has dissected and manipulated these allegations to reach their own conclusions. I ask all of you to wait and hear the truth before you label or condemn me. Don't treat me like a criminal, because I am innocent. I have been forced to submit to a dehumanizing and humiliating examination by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff Department and the Los Angeles Police Department earlier this week. They were supposedly looking for any discoloration, spotting, blotches, or other evidence of a skin color disorder called vitiligo, which I have previously spoken about. The warrant also directed me to cooperate in any examination of my body by their physician to determine the condition of my skin, including whether I have vitiligo or any other skin disorder. The warrant further stated that I had no right to refuse the examination or photographs, and if I failed to cooperate with them, they would introduce that refusal at any trial as an indication of my guilt. It was the most humiliating ordeal of my life. Michael's family immediately rallied around him and called their own press conference to show their support. They were adamant that the allegations were nothing more than a cruel and obvious attempt to take advantage of Michael's fame and wealth. Their belief was backed up by a taped telephone conversation in which the child in question's father declared his intention to win big time and destroy Michael. Catherine Jackson in particular was unequivocal in her support of her son. I'd like to let the world know that I'm behind my son. I don't believe any of this stuff that's being written about him because I raised him and I know him and that's just a statement people are making. However, not everyone in the Jackson family got behind Michael. His older sister, Latoya, whom he'd neither seen nor spoken to for years, decided to open up to the press. Estranged from the rest of the family since marrying her manager, Jack Gordon, and publishing her autobiography, Latoya held a press conference in Israel and made this shocking statement. Well, I must tell you that um, this is very difficult for me, that Michael is my brother. I love him a great deal, but I cannot and I will not be a silent collaborator of his crimes against small, innocent children. And if I remain silent, then I mean that I feel the guilt and the humiliation that these children are feeling, and I think it's very wrong. Latoya later retracted the statement, claiming her abusive husband had forced her to make the claims for financial gain, but the damage had been done. Putting on a brave face for fans, Michael performed in front of a crowd of 47,000 fans on his 35th birthday on the 29th of August. 
But behind the scenes, he was fighting chronic pain from an accident he'd sustained while on tour and was so stressed out by the investigation and accompanying press invasion that there were claims he was becoming addicted to painkillers and sedatives. The next night, moments before going on stage in Singapore, Michael collapsed and to the disappointment of tens of thousands of fans was forced to cancel the show. The next day, he was taken to hospital to undergo a brain scan. It appears that Mr. Jackson has been suffering recently from an acute vascular headache, which unfortunately, due to the severity this evening, caused the cancellation of tonight's performance. I was suddenly taken ill last night, and I am sorry for the cancellation of my performance. And I apologize for any inconvenience it might have caused my fans in Singapore. I look forward to seeing you at the stadium tomorrow. Thank you for your continued support and understanding. I love you all. Thank you. Michael's one source of consolation throughout the ordeal was his romance with Elvis Presley's daughter, Lisa Marie. Understanding the pressures of living under the intense glare of the media spotlight, Lisa Marie became his confidant and source of emotional support. During their many conversations over the phone, she ended up falling for him and they were married in the Dominican Republic in May 1994. Lisa Marie has since revealed that during the marriage, a troubled Michael confessed his fears that he might come to the same tragic end as her father. And after 20 months together, the gulf between the lovers had grown too wide. While Michael had been desperate to start a family, Lisa Marie already had two young children from her first marriage to Danny Keogh and didn't want any more. On January 18, 1996, her divorce from Michael was finalized, although they would remain friends for the rest of his life. However, the disturbances in Michael's private life hadn't distracted him from his first love, making music. On June the 15th, 1995, he'd released the biggest collection of his career. The double album, History, Past, Present and Future, Book One, contained 15 former hits and 15 new tracks and would become the biggest selling multiple disc album of all time, with sales of 20 million worldwide. The lead single was a duet with his baby sister, Janet. Scream hit back at the tabloid coverage of the 1993 child sexual abuse accusations aimed at him, and the record-breaking $7 million video to the song won him a Grammy Award. Despite all the negative media attention of the past few years, his fans remained as devoted as ever, sending the album's second single, You're Not Alone, straight into the Guinness Book of World Records for becoming the first single ever to debut at the top of the Billboard charts. Over in Britain, it remained at number one for six straight weeks and became his biggest selling single ever in the UK. The stage was set for another history-making television appearance. But during rehearsals for the HBO special at the Beacon Theatre in New York, Michael suddenly collapsed and was taken to Beth Israel Hospital on the Upper East Side. Arriving semi-conscious and dehydrated, doctors worked to stabilize his condition as his mother rushed to his side. When, well, on that type of call, it gets, the, it gets a high priority response. It's a very serious call. Luckily, we found someone who was breathing, uh, who was conscious, and we treated him for his symptoms. What were the symptoms? As I said, there was uh, some dehydration, some low uh, blood pressure, Nothing that appeared to be life-threatening. He was treated by EMTs and paramedics and brought to the hospital of his choice. Mr. Uh, Jackson is conscious. He has expressed sincere gratitude for all the nurses, physicians, and other uh, members of the Beth Israel staff, as well as, of course, the incredible outpouring of love from his fans throughout the world. Five days later, those fans were still maintaining their vigil as Janet emerged from the hospital. After being diagnosed and cleared of a viral infection, their hero greeted them with smiles and waves before disappearing into the waiting van. After Michael's divorce from Lisa Marie, he turned to dermatology nurse Deborah Rowe to fulfill his dream of having children. When they married in Sydney in November 1996, during the Australian leg of his history tour, she was already pregnant with little Prince Michael I. On April the 3rd, 1998, 
he was joined by a baby sister called Paris. A father at last, Michael was determined to protect his children from the press. Then in October 1999 came the news that he and Debbie were getting divorced and that Michael would retain sole custody of their two children. Despite being a single father of two, he stepped up his already demanding schedule of charity work and broke yet another Guinness World Record. His involvement with the staggering 39 charities far eclipsed the philanthropic efforts of any other celebrity or entertainer. At public appearances and charity events, he was tireless in his seeking out those less fortunate than himself. Whether pausing to give out a hug or simply waving and smiling to his fans, he always took the time to acknowledge their devotion. One charity among the many he publicly supported was the AIDS Foundation created by great friend and fellow former child star Elizabeth Taylor. Liz, who'd stood beside him throughout his troubles with the press, was to prove a wonderful source of support in his battle with Sony to regain control of his album masters and retain ownership of his share of the record company's catalogue. Once again, his fans backed him, but as the dispute wore on, Michael believed he was the victim of a personal vendetta by Sony chief Tommy Mottola and turned to Reverend Al Sharpton for help. In 2002, he threatened to sue Sony for failing to promote his album, Invincible. Sony, Tommy Mottola. Tommy Mottola is the president of the record division. He is a mean, he's a racist, and he's very, very, very devilish. That inflammatory accusation turned the dispute into an increasingly wild media circus. Sony counterattacked with assertions it had sufficiently promoted the album and with claims that Michael had refused to support its release with a tour of the US. Despite the dispute, Invincible was still a commercial success, debuting at number one in 13 countries and selling around 10 million copies worldwide. In the middle of it all, Michael had become the proud father of a third child, Prince Michael II. His eagerness to introduce Baby Blanket to eager fans in Berlin inspired him to embark on the rash act that would hog the world's front pages. The notorious baby dangling incident was seen by media commentators as evidence that the King of Pop had lost all sense of judgment. And although Michael later apologized for his terrible mistake, the stigma haunted him. Tragically, Michael's most traumatic media ordeal was still to come. On November the 20th, 2003, he was arrested and charged at Santa Barbara jail with lewd or lascivious acts with a child under 14. Protesting his innocence and confident of an acquittal, he waved to fans on his way to court. As the interminable legal process drew to a close almost two years later, his fans never lost faith that Michael would be found not guilty. Verdict. We, the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant not guilty of conspiracy as charged in count one of the indictment. Emotionally and mentally drained, as well as physically exhausted, Michael waved to the faithful in weary relief that the torment was over. But the terrible experience had taken a huge toll, and Michael needed to recover away from the spotlight. After the trial, he flew to the Persian Gulf and stayed as the guest of Sheikh Abdullah in Bahrain. In November 2006, he made a rare public appearance at the World Music Awards in Monaco to receive a Diamond Award for selling over 100 million records worldwide. The visit also coincided with the release of a special 25th anniversary edition of Thriller, a timely tribute to the biggest selling album of all time and a reminder that the King of Pop wasn't finished yet. In March 2009, it seemed that the years of waiting had all been worthwhile, when Michael called a press conference in London to announce he was ready to make a spectacular return to the stage. Overcome with emotion at the prospect of a Michael Jackson comeback, the ecstatic crowd wept and chanted his name. And as he took to the microphone for what was to be the very last time, 
Michael rewarded them with a winning smile and his trademark peace salute. These will be my final show performances in London. This will be it. This is it. And when I say this is it, it really means this is it. Because um, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be performing the songs my fans want to hear. This is it. I mean, this is really it. This is the final, this is the final curtain call. Okay? And um, I'll see you in July. The tears shed in joy at the announcement of his comeback turned to tears of despair and disbelief. When on the afternoon of June the 25th, TMZ.com broke the news that Michael had suffered a fatal heart attack at his rented home in Bel Air. In United in their grief, fans across the globe immediately went into mourning. In Although most of them had never met their idol or even seen him in the flesh, Michael Jackson's talent and generosity had touched them on such a personal level that they felt like they knew him. On July 7th, one billion people tuned in to his memorial service to pay their last respects to an artist who will not only be remembered as a consummate entertainer, but also as a great humanitarian, a loving father, and a devoted icon. I really do. You have to know that. I love you so much. Really. From the bottom of my heart. He is the king of music. Not pop, music. In fact, he's just the king. I just love him, and I just love him, and I just love him. And he's pure, he's in, inside and out, his heart, his soul, I love him. Jackson changed my life when I saw him moonwalk, when I heard him sing, when I seen him perform. Um, he's, he was life changing. He's the greatest artist of our time. Talent and music, wasted. Of course, uh, you have to be young, you have to be beautiful, talented, I'm but Michael Jackson is one of the best. Michael was and will, he will remain one of the greatest entertainers, entertainers that ever lived. One of the greatest entertainers that, that ever, ever lived. Well, they said Sammy Davis was the best entertainer ever. Uh, I put Michael right up there with him. Michael worked hard. You could see it when he hit the stage.